Think Tech Hawaii. Civil engagement lives here. Ah, oh, what a surprise we have for you. It's a two o'clock block here on a given Friday. This is likable science, but science is not just limited to technical science. Yes. <clears throat> it sometimes contains, includes, refers to social science. Okay, social science like they have at the, at the social science, what is it, school at UH Manoa. And we have a representative of that department here, the oral history department, the founder and progenitor of the modern version, all right, of, of, <laughs> of the Center for Oral History. Uh, well, Daviana McGregor. <laughs> I'm just a new director. I'm new not director. Okay, director. Okay, okay. <laughs> but, you know, can you tell me, it's really important that we know about this, um, where did it get established? When did it get established? How did it get established? And how did it get established at UH Manoa? Oh, yes. Well, the state legislature wanted to have uh, a Center for Oral History established. And originally it was in the Foundation for History and the Humanities. But in 1976, uh, I worked with other colleagues, actually Koji Ariyoshi and Carol Takahashi. We worked to have the center transferred to the University of Hawaii Manoa. And the first director actually was Chad Taniguchi, and uh, it was under the Department of Ethnic Studies, where well, we were a program at the time. And then in 1983, the um, center transferred to the Social Sciences Research Institute. And then just this year, in 2018, the center is now again back in the Department of Ethnic Studies, and I've been made the director. Mm -hmm. In the interim, in 1983, when it transferred to uh, a Social Science Research Center, we, the director was Warren Nishimoto, and he served as the director until 2017. So it's a, it's a part of the School of Social Sciences, it's, it, and it's like every other school, or, or rather, center, so to speak, in the, the, the Department of Social Sciences. Am I right? Yeah, well, it's, it's actually a, a college of social sciences. College and, of social sciences. Uh, yeah, we're one of the centers. There, there are other centers, like the uh, Public Policy Center, right. for example. Which runs the Energy yes. Policy Forum and all yeah, that. Yeah, right. And so, um, yeah, the Center for Oral History is one of those centers. Okay, so who, who's on top? Uh, is it Denise Conan? Is, is yes. she right on top of it? Correct, you? yeah. Denise Conan is the Dean for College of Social Sciences. Okay. Now we're going to find out, this is my big question, I asked you this on the phone too, I'm going to find out what is oral history? Because, you know, I mean, an uninitiated person like my own self, I would say, how do you keep history if it's oral? I mean, you can't keep on telling the story, but no, that's not, that's the wrong concept. It's oral and then you document it. Yes. Or, tell me how it works. Well, it, you know, you have a plan for a topic or someone that, whose life history you want to um, document or a, a key event in history. And so you make a plan to, um, you know, what kind of questions you want to ask. And uh, you get someone who narrates the story about their life involvement in a particular time or place and, or in an event. And then um, you get that person's permission to transcribe, and they review it. And after you, they look at the record of it, uh, then we we post it on Scholar Space at UH Manoa Hamilton Library, so it's online. And we have um, under Warren Nishimoto there and Chad Taniguchi, there are 800 interviews that were done of men and women in Hawaii, and over 30,000 pages of transcripts that were approved for sharing with the broader public. This is since when? I mean, when did this collect? Since 1976. That's the first time. It yeah, that we, in our, that we started. Uh, that, I was yeah. saying, I don't, I don't know uh, if this fits in the right context, but around that time, there was a renaissance in Hawaiian culture. Yes. And it seems to me, just as, a, as a, you know, an observer, that this is part of that renaissance, am I right? Yeah, I think um, Hawaiian culture, and I think a, a consciousness among local people about having our history uh, told our way. In fact, when our Department of Ethnic Studies got founded, that was our, our slogan, our history, our way. And um, we recognized that a lot of history that was recorded and written was only told from the point of view of those in authority and control, the oligarchy that had controlled Hawaii during the territorial period. And so we wanted to, you know, document the stories of everyday men and women sure. and all the contributions that working people and farmers and fishers made to building Hawaii and not just 
have one perspective of our history. Oh, that's so it. valuable, and it, and it must be so rich to be in. I envy your job. <laughs> so uh, is it? But it's not limited to Native Hawaiian no, culture. Not it's at like all. all cultures. Yes, yeah. uh -huh. this is really valuable. Yeah. So like our first project was uh, the history of Waialua and Haleiwa, and we have histories of the uh, Native Hawaiian community, but also Filipino community, Japanese community. Portuguese community and many of them shared their experiences working for the plantation and it was at a critical time when the plantation was closing, closing down at yeah. Wailua so it was really important to document the histories and the experiences of the people on the plantation at yeah. that critical moment in time. And the other the other thing is they were getting older. Yeah. Yes. This is a consideration of if you're course. taking oral if, yeah. I, if I was taking oral history I would line everybody up in terms of age. Yes. I would talk to the oldest <laughs> ones first. And if you were infirm in any way, you'd jump to the beginning, the yeah. front of the line. Yeah. Sure. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Yeah. yeah. And, you know, the, one of the other stories that we did was the Filipino labor strike, Hana Pepe. That was one of the second projects that we did. But over the years, we've looked at people in different occupations, teachers, store owners, mm -hmm. um, and other kinds of business men and we've done uh, histories of communities in transition like this is I brought it as an example well, let's of, talk about this yeah. what is this book well so is this it, is an oh, example I can't lift it. <laughs> Viviana, it's heavy it's very important it's a it's a history of Waikiki in transition and uh -huh. it goes from 1900 to 1985 because I think the people who we were interviewing, their memories went back as far as 1900. Mm -hmm. And then it has uh, well, photos photographs. that we collect. We, we do a lot of, uh, first we do a background history and we do a timeline of the, if it's a community, then you know the, the, the history of the community and changes in the community. And then, um, then this is the uh, transcribed interview, so it has the question and their response. This is strictly and, a transcription. Yeah. And it looks like a typed page is what yeah. it looks like. Yeah. And uh, this, though, has also been put on the internet and it's available at Scholars Space at okay. UH Hamilton Library. So this is volume four of, you know, four volumes. On so there's four this, volumes of, yeah. of just this period. Mm -hmm. Okay, and, and we the also, photographs are photographs of the people that were interviewed. People that were interviewed, yeah. And then we also collect uh, pictures, not only that, pi pictures that people we interviewed shared of the area they gave you, as yeah. well, yeah. We did Waipio Valley also, we and Kaka'ako. Oh, don't did, put it away. Oh, okay. I, I, I don't want to embarrass <laughs> you, but I would like to ask you uh -huh. to find a paragraph oh, and okay. read it to us. All right. Just so we can get the feeling of what this <laughs> reads like. <laughs> okay. Um, so let's see, uh, let's see, they're talking about crab. Um, let's see, uh, oh, here, limu. Did a lot of the neighborhood women pick limu? Yes, but when it was time to pick, everybody went out and picked the same time. Oh, yes, the crowd, but the different Hawaiians would go out and they pick, and they clean it. Whenever you go out to help them pick, they divide the limu. So did they have seasons when you could pick? Yes, there were seasons for different types, right in that bay, the seasons. And oh, I'm telling you, when the crabs, the big white crabs were done, oh, you ought to see, they were just, it was especially was crab season when they came in, and oh, they came in by the thousands. So we would line up on the beach, and we'd have these long, actually, they used to take sheets and strip them. We save the strip, and when the wave brings them in, we would take it and we'd scoop the water and roll the crabs on the dry part of the shore from the beach. With the sheets? Yeah, with the sheets, just scoop them. Then the others who were on the other side would gather all the crabs and put them in the bags. <laughs> you know, it strikes me, I mean, of course, there's so much to be gained by going through that. Uh -huh. And in fact, parsing out that language is what are we really talking about here? Mm -hmm. But the one thing that strikes me, Daviana, is that life in those days was so completely different mm, than yes. our lives, all of our lives today. That's right. It's a, it's a disconnect of sorts, and you have to travel through the time machine, yes. through the Proustian <laughs> keyhole, as the case may be, <laughs> and find you know uh, our roots, our childhood, um, and their childhood. It's a, it's a trip. It's what, a voyage. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. And you know, you know with so in Hawaii today, uh, about 45% of the people who live here were not born and raised here. So having this kind of community history is a way to help build uh, a common identity and to a sense of a legacy here in the islands, so that whether you were born here or not, you have a way to begin to connect to the stories and the histories of the people who were you know, living here before yeah. you. 
Do you find there's redundancy in there? Do you find that the histories of one person and another are similar? Do you find that the one, well, I'll ask one, one question <laughs> at a time, um, and, and we'll explore. Um, do, do you find that, uh, you know, there are common touch points in one history and another? Well, I think maybe uh, uh, when you talk about plantation era, you know, there, there's a lot of maybe commonalities about the, the you know, the struggle and the hardship and the, the role of the Lunas, for example, and, and how hard it was and waking up early and, you know, the hard, hardships there. Uh, so that probably is a theme that runs throughout in, in plantation stories. Um, myself, I'm now involved in a, 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 a oral history of people who pick limu. That's why it's interesting that I open it to that page, <laughs> and we're, because um, our limu area, you know, the seaweed areas are are being impacted very seriously from pollution, from runoff, from like things like chemicals from golf courses going uh -huh. to the ocean and, yeah. and contaminating the limu, and or sediment running into the the ocean, more sediment than you know normal in the seasonal. So we have a group of kupuna who are who are on every island who are practitioners and taking care of those limu areas, reseeding where necessary. And so we, we've been interviewing them. And of course, they each come from a different island, so they each have different stories to tell. But when I ask them about, oh, how do you prepare it, uh, it's very similar preparation, you know, how, how they, they prepare the emu to make it ono to eat. So if I wanted to do research, uh -huh. and I wanted to learn about the way people spent their day, you know, mm. almost like a documentary kind of research. But it'd be fiction, but it would be exactly how people spent their day. I could go into this book, or any of the four volumes here, and I could study what they did all day. <clears throat> and then I could be really accurate, and I could reflect, you know, how it was, couldn't I? Yeah. So is this available to me? Can I go look at this? Yes. Um, as I said, online, online. at Scholar Space. Yeah, yeah. okay. Yeah. Well, you know, you know, to me, that's very valuable. I, I have just a comment on the Descendants movie. Mm. You know? <laughs> yes. The Descendants movie, to me, was, um, it was skin deep. And uh, sure, there were some things in there we all know about and you know, appreciate uh -huh. and all that, mm -hmm. but... Um, you know, the, the, uh, the rule against perpetuities and holding of land and Kauai, whatnot. Yeah, yeah. But, but um, you know, in fact, I, I don't think they captured it the way a Hawaii producer, director team might have captured it had they had, they had some kind of daily uh, experience kind of, you know, narrative uh -huh. about what was going on. And I could, I could see doing The Descendants, but moving it back into 1930 or so, oh, yes. looking at <laughs> what you have online, and mm. really coming down with a really valuable piece of work. I mean, narrative would be fictional, but it would be very close to the way it was, which we don't know because we mm -hmm. forgot already yeah. how it worked. Yeah. yeah, right. The other thing I was going to ask you is now, 1900 to 1985, in there, there are some significant historic events that yes. took place in Hawaii. I mean, World War II, for yes. example. Yes. Um, and of course, a lot of the statehood, a lot of the you know, huge social changes yeah. that have happened, yes. happened in that very period. Correct. Do you find that these oral histories include discussions of those things? Y yes, these, these were made to look at the transition that this um, area, Waikiki, went through and what happened to the families uh, when the development occurred, because I don't think, I mean, think mo most of the people who were interviewed no longer live in Waikiki, but they were recalling what it was like to grow up there. But, you know, it's only memories because they they no longer live in in that area and you know this is an experience common a lot of people especially on shorefront ocean fronts mm -hmm. have no longer can afford to live in that area because the property taxes got so high and so you know they have been displaced and you need to talk to those original families to get a pick, sense of what that area was originally mm. you know it's only part of our imagination at this point yeah but there is a sea change thing here. Yes, I mean, if I true. went back to the 1900 stories, mm -hmm. um, I, I can. They'd be down at Kapi'olani Park, 
and they'd be wearing their Sunday frilly dresses. <laughs> yeah. And uh, the gentlemen would be on the arm, and uh, they'd be riding horses and, True. and having yes. picnics uh, with umbrellas and all this. <laughs> right? In 1900. Yeah. I mean, I don't know if you have pictures of that, but that would be my imagination of what. Um, you know, the oral history would be like in that period. Mm -hmm. Well, <clears throat> as time went on, maybe they weren't along the water so much, they weren't in Capulani Park, they, their lives had changed from generation to generation. And I can track that here, can I? Yeah, I think so, yes. <laughs> that would be really interesting. It is a good research start mm -hmm. for anybody who really wants to understand the sea changes in Hawaii. Yes, that's right. And, you know, when I mean, they're talking about thousands of crabs coming in, you, you don't have that anymore at Waikiki. You, yeah. you know, maybe like Kahana, <laughs> but not Waikiki. <laughs> I have a million questions to ask you, Daviana, but I'm going to have to hold up for one minute while we take this little quick okay. break. All in right. the fullness of time, you know, this was 85 years. It won't be long. It'll be one minute. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Hello, and welcome to Out of the Comfort Zone. I am your villainous host, R.B. Kelly. Today we are playing two truths and a lie, and I will tell you two truths, and you will tell me which one is the lie. Truth number one, this is a real mustache. Truth number two, I want you to watch my show on Tuesdays at 1 p.m. So tune in and let me know which is the truth. And which is the lie? I'm R.B. Kelly with Out of the Comfort Zone and show up next Tuesday to see my mustache live. And aloha, my name is Calvin Griffin, the host of Hawaii in Uniform. And every Friday at 11 o'clock here on Think Tech Hawaii, we bring you the latest in what's happening within the military community. And we also invite all your response to things that's happening here. For those of you who haven't seen the program before, again, we invite your participation. We're here to give information, not disinformation, and we always enjoy response from the public. But join us here, Hawaii in uniform, Fridays, 11 a.m., here on Think Tech Hawaii. Aloha. Okay, we are so delighted to be here with Daviana McGregor the director of the Oral History Center in the College of Social Sciences at UH Manoa. She's, she's, she has a trove, a tre treasure trove <laughs> yes. of history. Mm -hmm. So just to clarify, if you didn't get it before, oral history um, is oral, but the idea in the center is to m memorialize it. Yes. So we capture it so it doesn't run away into the nether. Okay, and so we're collecting this in the center. And, um, and we have a pretty good collection now, thousands of, uh, of, these, of these oral history interviews. Many, many, many of the people, I'm sure, have died by now, yeah? Yes, unfortunately, yes. Yeah. That's true. So tell me, you know, who comes and sees it? I can look at it on my internet, right? Yes. Right here in the studio, mm -hmm. I can go look at it. Right. But do you have people coming around? Do you know how popular these are and who's looking and what yeah. they're doing? Yeah, well, we, <clears throat> we get a report on the internet uh, scholar space so you know there's thousands of people who look at it every month and um, it, you know over the whole collection which is the 800 interviews 30,000 pages but uh, so we, yeah we get a sense and it's from all over the world really I think um, a lot of scholars are looking at if they're doing research on a particular topic then this is really a great resource for them you know, if they're doing, if they were doing Waikiki or tourism, this would be wonderful. It's to a look great at. start, isn't it? It's yeah, a, impact. Oh. We, we did a story about World War II survivors. We did a story about the tsunami survivors, and so yeah, we, there's a lot of really um, important primary data uh, material that's uh, in the collection sure. and available through the scholar space. Yeah. <clears throat> you know about Oahu Cemetery and the Poo Poo Dinner. Um, sort of, I'll, yes. I'll tell you, I, I go every year. Oh, okay. You know, Wahoo Cemetery, yeah. it's, it's an old cemetery. Right. I mean, yeah, they stopped putting bodies in a long time ago. Uh -huh. But the Mission Houses Museum okay, conducts this poo poo event. Oh, okay. And uh, they take you around from grave to grave, and they have an actor yes. at each of these half a dozen graves that you oh, go visit. Yes. And the actor has a script written by people who research yes. off mm -hmm. this kind of material. And the actor tells you what his life was like, or yes. her life. Yeah. Okay. What what I find interesting, though, is that you know we don't realize that back in the day there weren't that many people here, mm -hmm. and so you you talk to one person buried in the in the cemetery, 
And then you go down the other side of the cemetery and talk to another person, and they knew each other. Yes. They were part of the same community. Right. They may, may even not have liked each other. <laughs> <laughs> and I just wonder if, in, in the case of these oral histories, they refer to each other. They talk mm -hmm. about their lives and how their lives touched others. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and then you have others whose lives touched them. Right, right. <laughs> yeah, I think so. Probably there's a collection of political leaders, so definitely oh, sure. that, yeah, would have, yeah. that would happen. Yeah. And you have that exchange where also in one of our ongoing projects is to interview the delegates from to the 1978 Constitutional Convention. So of course they would oh, interface with each other so as well. And yeah, we're hoping to get as many delegates as possible to contribute to this project. Well, there might be another con con. You have to be out there. <laughs> and that actually, uh, you know, provokes my next question is, what's the ongoing process? Mm -hmm. are, are you out there Monday through Friday with your pad or your recorder? Uh, interviewing people so that they can be put in a modern version, uh -huh, a modern, uh -huh. uh, you know, book, of, a collection <clears throat> of these interviews? Well, I so said, we, 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 uh, there's myself, and then I have a graduate researcher and two undergraduate assistants. So we've been doing interviews, uh, as I said, of the Kupuna, who gather Limu, and then in conjunction with the Limu Hui. Right now. Right. And, and they're then, being accumulated and they're on the website also. Well, we are in the process now of transcribing the interviews that we did in March. And then when they're finished, we will share it with them and then they will have the opportunity to decide what goes in and what comes out, if they want everything taken out. And then we'll put that collection, um, the transcription will go on Scholar Space. But the, um, uh, the video that we took, uh, we are arranging to hopefully have it uh, on the moving image archive at Ulu Ulu at West Oahu, so that if they want to s arrange to see the video of it, then they can do so through that archive and that repository. Oh, okay. So we, we're partnering with a lot of different um, yeah, repositories. Yeah, really lighting me up now when you say video. Yeah, because mm -hmm. I told you in the break, you know, I'm interested in the Steven Spielberg Shoah mm -hmm. project, yes. which, which means Holocaust. Uh -huh. uh, where he interviewed thousands, video interviewed thousands of people, <clears throat> you know, who survived. Yes. And, and the deal there, by the way, is they don't show the video until mm. the individual dies. Oh, it's a matter of yeah. privacy. Yes. And, mm -hmm. and, you know, just good taste. Mm -hmm. um, you know, one question that comes to mind is the, if people decide they'd really rather not, right. if they rather not you actually publish their interview or that's their, their prerogative you just you pull it yes that's the end of that mm -hmm. okay. yeah it's totally up to them and yeah. you know maybe they want it just for their family and that's fine and some people do well. want, yes. want to limit it yeah. uh-huh yeah. so in the case of spielberg they keep these videos um the videos are all done by students or interns that sort of thing as far as i know um and they are they form a, a there's a pattern of questions mm -hmm. I mean, of course they never the same questions sure. as another but they they, they want to get the same kinds of information. So how do you do this? I mean, if I if I said to you, Daviana, I want to, in, I like interviewing people. Uh -huh. I really, I really like. Yeah, that, yeah, so. you're very good at it. <laughs> could, I, could I actually go down and interview people? This would be interesting. Well, we would want you to go through a training. We, you know, we're going to start offering workshops so that you could have a, a, a more systematic approach to it. There's a Oral History Association, and they have a set of best practices to follow uh, to protect the, the narrator and make sure that the narrator is, understands that they have the right to, um, you know, recall whatever they say or not to have published what they want, but also if they want to, then to fully participate and let it be, you know, available to the public. Mm -hmm. So there are standards to follow and just to uphold everybody's um, you know, respect and, and, and treat their, their memories with dignity that, that it deserves. So that's a process that we will go through. So this is an ongoing living process mm -hmm. of finding people who are willing to do it, finding people who'd be interesting, um, and, and memorializing the history of Hawaii, which is so precious really to us all. Yeah, so another thing we're doing, since these are, you know, in on the internet, we wanted to uh, highlight and spotlight some of the stories. And so we are working with Bill Dorman at, in the conversation at uh, KHPR, Hawaii Public, Hawaii Public Radio. Yeah. And we were going to be doing podcasts. Uh, we have funding from Hawaii Committee for the Humanities to do a set of six podcasts in this year, and um, where we go through and we excerpt some of the 
the memories there, and we have the voices, and we weave together a podcast about that story. Our first one's going to be about the tsunami of 1946. And so we have different memories about, you know, how, you know, when they saw it, they, they were, didn't know what was happening. Uh, people were going down to the beach to get fish. They were running up the road, you know, and, and then in the aftermath, what, how they recovered. So we wanted to tell that story. And there's been a lot of attention to, with the um, volcano erupting, uh, every time there's an earthquake, we, we sure. hear, oh, there was no tsunami generated, which you're very fortunate for, because if there was a tsunami generated, we would only have 15 minutes to respond. And so in a way, we'd be in the same situation that people found themselves in on April 1st, 1946, no warning. They only begin to see the ocean receding, extraordinary receding of the ocean, and then they have to escape Through run to first the hills. Person narrative. Yes, yeah. So they're telling their stories. You know, some of them were just in in grade school at the time that because they were being interviewed currently, and you know they they didn't know what was going on, and they had to run up the road to escape the the tidal wave as it was coming in. They were running up, you know, in, in Hilo and. Is this a, uh, so you, you're talking about somebody looking at the raw research material, yes. the interviews, mm -hmm. and then writing it up in some way as a, as yeah. a story? Yeah, extracting the, and then we'll find that section of the tape, and then we're going to extract it and then weave together a podcast from that Oh, story. that'd be great. Oh, so you, you're taking the sound for Bill mm -hmm. Dorman. Right. Oh, yeah. I love it. I love it. We don't, if you have a spare one audio. lying on the floor sometime, would you send it to me? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So we'll, and then after we do the story, we're going to put it on our website so people can go and access it. So we figured uh, by doing that, people would then become more aware of what we have, and uh, it would, you know, it makes it more accessible to the public. Yeah, yeah and the public will find. A continuing interest, in yes, it, which is good for so. the center and yeah. good for the whole notion. Yeah. yeah, and to let us know if there are other individuals we should be interviewing and stories that we should be following. I got a yeah. call about um, documenting the history of the painted church in Honau now uh, in Kona yeah. today. So we were talking with someone about that, and uh, there's I was, a lot. Of, I was there about oh, sixty days ago. Yeah. Ah, <laughs> yeah, it's a. Uh, Interesting history. I guess they reconstructed the whole church, but they didn't restore the paintings. The paintings, you know, are, are I guess need to There's be. There's so many uh, things like that, uh -huh. and unless you capture it, you know, it's. Uh, yeah. So you know, uh, what I what I've learned with you today here, Debiana, is that it's not just social science; it's also science. Just like Ethan Allen, you know, the, the regular host of the show, uh -huh. is always is always doing is likable science, and that means that you have to move with the times. Yes, <laughs> that you have to keep on uh, finding people, whatever means, and there's probably a lot of ways you can find people. It's not only word of mouth; it's more than that. And then um, you can, if you put this on the web, that means you can search yes. using searches. So I can, I can search for the, the tsunami. I can search for the painted church, and, and I can find it among thousands of pages of transcript. Correct. Yes. And, and then you spoke today about video, which uh, always excites me. And you can do video, just like Steven Spielberg, of the people that give you these interviews. Yes. So what are you going to do with the video? Because it's right along our line, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. Well, again, the video, we want to make ex make small um, uh, stories, storylines. Uh, we have another part of our project is uh, our professor, Tai Tengan, has a field school in oral history of Wailua. And the students that work with him in that field school have done story maps. So they have the individual. And they show, you know, the story. He, per person is talking in, in the video of that person, and then you can. You know, then they show the place that the person is talking about, and they also show a map of where it's located. So that it gives us a new dimensions to make it more visible, and you know, then you can also see the person, hear the words, and um, it's just you know, multifaceted. It's really wonderful. Totally charming. A treasure <laughs> for Hawaii. Yeah. We should all know about it and, and look at it and take advantage of it, read and write about it and create a, a, a literature around it. Thank you so much. Thank Indiana. you very much. It's been wonderful to talk to you. <laughs> Aloha. Aloha. <laughs> <laughs>